Teolir. Guppies. They're rather fun little creatures and quite attractive to boot. They've also spent several years in the service of science, where various selective breeding programs have allowed us to gain some very important insight into brains and intelligence. Well, fish intelligence anyway. And so today we're going to look through a series of studies using selectively bred guppies, some selected for intelligence and some selected not for intelligence, and we're going to look at some of the very interesting differences in behaviour that the two groups exhibit. So let us begin, shall we? The first very interesting point here is about the genetic populations of the guppies that are used in all of the experiments we're going to be looking at, specifically how they were bred. The slides that we're about to look at were taken off of a YouTube video, which was shot with a handheld camera, and so the video quality is generally awful, as is the sound quality of the videos. But it's okay, we only need a couple of snapshots from the presentation to understand what's happening. So in the beginning, they just have a collection of guppies. Now, of course, it is a random genetic population, so it's generally a big old mix-up of what kind of guppies you've got, and therefore, of course, a big mix-up in brain-to-body size ratios. So, of course, the quickest and easiest way of breeding two populations, one with large brains and one with small brains, is you take the population, you take the largest brained ones and the smallest brained ones, and you have them breed as two separate populations. And then each time you do that, you remove any of the intermediate ones. So you you selectively breed for certain traits, and in this instance it was done for three generations. So what we end up with is this. You can see this chart divided into two halves, females and males, both from the original population, one population going along the top of the graph and another population going along the bottom, indicating the large brain to the small brain respectively. And what makes this very interesting is that all of the guppies were kept in the exact same environment. So this change, and any other causes that this change may result in, must have, by definition of how this experiment was done, spring from the differences in genes between the two populations. The first study which we're going to be looking at was basically a very simple cognitive test. A card with either two symbols or four symbols was shown to the fish on one side of their tank. One of these was associated with a food reward and the other not. Rather unsurprisingly, over time, some of the fish would learn that this card with this number of symbols on it signified that food was about to happen, and so they would swim up to the card because that's where they would get the food. And one of the key findings that resulted from this experiment was that the larger-brained fish were able to respond better to this stimulus. They were more capable than their small-brained brethren of learning the difference between the numbers 2 and 4. This was easily demonstrated by presenting them with both cards, one on either side of the tank, and the fish swimming to the number that they associated with food. So this shows not only that even quite small and what many people would assume to be stupid fish are actually quite capable of memory puzzles and recall. Not only that, but in this instance an 11% larger brain seems to aid the fish in their ability to learn this task. One other interesting result which was found from this study, since it was a multi-generational study, it was noted that fish which developed larger brains also developed smaller guts and as a result of this produced fewer offspring. And as a result of this, this study was the first to demonstrate experimentally that evolving a larger brain comes at the cost of a decreased gut mass and decreased offspring production, while it confers a quite sizable cognitive advantage. There were a few criticisms levelled at this study, all of which seemed to be largely invalidated by virtue of how the study was actually performed. One of them being that the stimulus-reward contingency between the large or small-brained fish might provide an alternative explanation for why larger-brained females outperformed the smaller-brained females. Unfortunately, this objection doesn't hold up to scrutiny when you consider the fact that the feeding regime of the fish was very controlled. Another was the idea that the fish may have inherited some sort of bias or preference towards identifying two symbols or four symbols. This was discounted because it was a multi-generational experiment, and thus different individuals within each population were subject to either the stimulus of two or the stimulus of four, and then their offspring could either be subject to the same or the opposite, and then their offspring subject to the same or the opposite. So that somewhat discredits that objection. Another more interesting 
interesting objection was to do with energy maintenance. The idea that the fish with the larger brains need to feed more in order to maintain their energetically costly, much larger brains. And so this, as a result, gives them more opportunity to learn the reward stimulus, which is the food. Unfortunately, this objection didn't hold any water, because the large-brained fish did not differ in their feeding propensity compared to the smaller-brained fish. And the final objection, which I also think is one of the more silly ones, and I think the one that demonstrates that Healy and Rowe, the people who challenged this paper, maybe have a little less knowledge on this subject than they ought to in order to criticise it, suggested that maybe visual cues were more salient to larger-brained animals, because their optic tectum, the part of the brain that processes visual information, is larger in the larger-brained fish than the smaller-brained fish. And then they proposed that the smaller-brained fish may use olfactory senses, their sense of smell, to find food. Despite the fact that in their criticism of this paper they acknowledged that the brains between the smaller and larger fish differentiated only in overall size of the brain, and not the specific areas of the brain that you would associate with each one of those senses, which is exactly what you would expect to see if one population of those fish began developing some sort of advantage in either sight or smell. One final thing to note about this first study before we move on to any of the other ones is the fact that the cognitive ability increase that we saw in the fish with larger brains was only really observable in the females and not so much the males. But we'll be addressing that shortly in this next study, which uses different testing which is thought to be more relevant to the male cognitive ability. So this second study looks at the spatial learning and perception skills of male guppies, and is still comparing the large brain population to the small brain population. This particular experiment was done over two generations, with a 9% difference in relative brain size. The testing done in this study is a direct follow-up to the previous study that we just went through. The proposed reason why this test might be better at finding the differences in male behaviour compared to female behaviour was noted with the hypothesis that female reproductive success may be mainly food limited, whereas males are limited by their access to females. So a test with a food reward may be more appropriate for female guppies, but a test with a female reward may be more appropriate to males. And because males search for females in quite large winding areas of water, populated by roots, weeds, and all manner of other river debris, they have to learn their way around that environment and remember where all all the twists and turns are so that they can better ferret out those females. And so to test the males' general spatial awareness and spatial learning, it was decided that they were going to be sent through a maze, and then data collected on the performance of all of the males as they go through this maze over a number of days, and then a comparison to see which group, if either of them, performed better than the other. So, the experiment is set up, the maze is prepared, the hypothetical best time that a guppy could finish this maze in, should they take the shortest path and swim as quickly as possible, is 7.7 .7 seconds. And when they get to the end of the maze, they shall be greeted by a delicious virgin guppy with whom they can frolic for three minutes. Yes, the study does specifically state that these female guppies are virgins, because that way they will be more receptive to mating. And this should of course be adequate reward for these male guppies and their exertions. The results of this experiment were somewhat unsurprising, one might even say common sense. The larger brained fish were initially slower than the smaller brained fish to explore their surroundings, possibly because they were simply more curious about their surroundings than their smaller brained opposition. But as time went on, the larger brained fish notably improved their score, eventually overtaking the small brained fish once they had time to learn the route through the maze. And this is quite an interesting one, firstly because there is still the genetically implied cause of the larger brain and thus increased cognitive function, but it also suggests that greater cognitive function in the wild will yield a fitness advantage to the males because it increases their access to females. And the study from a few years earlier seems to indicate that females like big-brained males as well, because this study's indicated that female guppies had a preference for males that were able to solve mazes faster. So our genetically super-intelligent uber-fish seem to be getting all of the advantages, 
And it doesn't stop there. Rather interestingly, the brain size differences also carried over into the behavioral responses of these guppies towards predators. Once again, this seems to be one of those traits that only really affected the females. For this experiment, the fish were broken up into groups of varying sizes, but always separated by sex and genetic lineage. The fish would then have introduced to them either a pike cichlid model, which is one of their natural predators, or a coffee cup and their reactions to these new stimuli would be recorded for 20 minutes after the introduction. And by observing what was going on from above, the scientists were able to generate these heat maps, which are just absolutely fascinating, and we'll have a little look-see at what they're saying. So A1 and A2 are groups of females and groups of males, respectively. As you can see, the males in A2, they tend to stay away from the predator model, very rarely venturing any closer than 10 centimeters. The females, however, which is A1, you can see a slightly different pattern. They are a lot more clustered around the model, and as you can see, they actually start approaching the model really quite close to the sides and the back of the model, leaving that blue horseshoe shape in front of the model where the predator's mouth would be, which when you think about it makes complete sense. And what this indicates to us is that they are using a cone of attack avoidance strategy. Comparing these two models gives us A3, which shows the difference between where females and males spent the most time. As you can see, males generally spent a lot more time further away from the predator model, whereas females resulted in that cluster slightly nearer to it. And this indicates a few very interesting things. First of all, the females are a lot more dull compared to the males when it comes to appearance. So males with their much brighter colours may simply decide, hey, it's not worth even trying to go anywhere near it because I'm a really obvious target. And also, looking at all of the B figures, we can see some very interesting things regarding brain size. So B1 and B2 are small brain and large brain females. So what you'll notice is a very slight difference in the distributions of them. The large brain females avoid being in front of the predator far more than the small brain females. But then what happens is something really quite unusual. You'll see there's a lot more yellow directly underneath the predator in the large brain females as opposed to the small brain females. And this pattern emerged because the larger brain females in this experiment actually began taking shelter underneath the predator model. And they did this more so than the smaller brained females because they had approached it from the sides and from the back, assessed the situation, realized that this model isn't actually a predator, it can't do anything to them, and so they can go and hide underneath it should an actual predator show up. And then B3 is comparing the two. The pink is where small brain females outnumber large brain females, and the blue is where large brain females outnumber the small brain females. So you can see the small brain females tended to hang around in that 10 centimeter circle around the predator model, whereas the larger brain females, well, they just seem to go pretty much anywhere, which once again seems to indicate that they've worked out that this thing isn't a threat, so they either go back to foraging or they go and take shelter underneath it, whereas the smaller brain females are still trying to work it out. Figures B4, B5, and B6 are to do with the male populations. And as you can see, small brain to large brain, it really doesn't make that much of a difference. The males just don't go anywhere near it. Which is why the B6 comparison of small brain to large brain, it's just kind of scattered all over the place because there was no real distinct pattern that the males were engaging in. They were just simply staying away from the predator entirely. The sea line on the bottom, we're now looking at the numbers of fish which were in those environments. So C1, 2, and 3 are all looking at small brain females. C1 is a single fish, C2 is a pair of fish, C3 is a shoal of four fish. So on those three, what you'll notice is that there's really still that same pattern emerging. C1, which is the single fish, it's still mostly hanging around the back and the sides of the predator. C2, again, pretty much the same pattern, mostly to the sides of the predator. And C3, again, just kind of continues that overall pattern, mostly to the sides and back of the predator, and quite a way away out in front of it. Cs 4, 5, and 6 are looking at the large brain female, again, as a single pair and shoal of four, respectively. And as you can see there, they kind of repeat the same pattern 
of the large brain fish in B2, still hanging out more to the sides and back of the predator, but after a while just working out that it isn't a threat, and as you can especially see in C6, when you've got a little group of fish, they seem to get more confident, and then they've really closed in on this model which they've determined isn't a threat to them. And as with the previous models, C7, 8, and 9 are just comparing the two different groups. So in C7, the singletons, you can see a lot of pink, which is the small brain females outweighing the large brain females in the area, again, mostly to the sides and back of the predator. C8, which is looking at pairs, and again you see the small-brained females forming that 10 centimeter away circle examining the predator. And then C9, which is the big shoals, you really see the large brain females outnumbering the small brain females tucked up right next to that model. Because it seems that as a larger group, they work out quicker that this thing isn't a threat and then start using it as shelter. The other really interesting thing was analysing distance over time, which this graph does here, A being the small-brained females and B being the large-brained females. And you can see that the larger-brained females did show a more cautious response to the predator model in the beginning, but as time goes on, that pattern disappears, which is pretty consistent with the heat maps that we just looked at. And then, perhaps rather unsurprisingly, all of these results were backed up by a live predator trial done using 4800 guppies, put in a very large tank with one of their natural predators. Over the course of a week of observation, it was noted that larger brained females survived longer and in greater numbers, and that larger brained females were generally better at predator inspection behaviour. And this all then led to the final question which I'm going to be addressing today. We've seen that we can selectively breed these fish for larger or smaller brains, and that this can be done when the environment is 100% controlled for, thus indicating that this trait is genetic. And we've seen that this genetic difference between these two populations of fish affects how they react to predators, and indeed affects their survival as well. So then the next question is, do predators select for brain size in the fish? Well, to answer this question, there was a five-year-long study done in 16 different sites in Trinidad. And what this survey did was to measure the predator biomass of guppies. That was to measure the number of fish and the number of shrimps in each area. And then the female brain anatomy of guppies in all of those areas was also measured. And the results should really surprise no one. The females in these different areas had different brains. Their brains were evolving in response to the predators which were most represented in those areas. And this, I think, is just a perfect example of the constant feedback loop between genes and the environment. The environment creates a pressure for change, genes respond, those which are more suited for that environment survive and are passed on, ones which don't fall by the wayside. And this gives us an indication that this process is target specific. But we also know that we can replicate this process while totally controlling the environment, removing any and all selection pressure, and thus altering nothing but the genes of a population. So this is just another data point up on the wall demonstrating once again that yes, you absolutely can breed a genetic population for cognitive ability and intelligence. But hey, it could all just be a massive coincidence, and all those fish which were kept in identical environments, the only thing changing being the genes, well I guess some of those fish might have just had better schools than some of the other ones.